This is a Digital Music Trends episode 165 on the 8th of January 2014. This week, a Grace Nod score rhythm, Rap Genius gets a slap on the wrist from Google, Beats Music planning a big launch, exciting CES gadgets, recorded music sales in 2013, Gaga on Art Pop, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. DMT is available on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio as well as Audioboo, there's a lot of them these days and to get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends on, or email on contact at DigitalMusicTrends.com and uh, um, the Digital Music Trends uh, now offers a voluntary subscription option on digitalmusictrends.com, which is essentially it's a, a recurring donation. So if you love the show and you listen to it every week and you can contribute, then head on to digitalmusictrends.com and take a look at the option on the right-hand side. And this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome back Martin Davis, the developer evangelist at Sangrid, as well as uh, organizer of Music Hack Day London, as well as uh, many more Music, ha- music Hack Days, uh, and uh, uh, really experienced uh, in the music space, especially in the music tech space. So hi, Martin. And, uh, uh, great to have you on. How's it going? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Matt. It's nice to be back. It's great to have you. And uh, it's also a great pleasure to have for the first time Ben Graham, a, reported, a, a reporter at Strategy Eye. So hi, Ben, and how's things? I'm good. It's great to be here. It's uh, really great to have you here. And thanks, guys, for uh, sticking around. We had a few technical issues at the beginning of, of uh, the recording today, but few. Uh, it hope, hopefully, we've resolved everything uh, by now. And uh, so today I want to open by talking about Grace Note. So uh, the music and film metadata specialist announced at the end of December that it had changed hands uh, from Sony Corp to Tribune Co. Uh, in a deal worth $170 million. So Sony had originally purchased the business for $200 million. 60 million in 2008 and so it had to accept essentially a 90 million hit on the value of the company in the resale uh, but even as it changed hands uh, Grace Note had the company's uh, uh, product roadmap well in place uh, and it actually announced a new uh, initiative uh, last week called Grace Note Rhythm which uh, plans to become the backbone for a number of new uh, uh, music apps uh, and uh, internet radio services so essentially uh, they've launched an API driven uh, product uh, which uh, delivers data like genre, mood, tempo, era, origin, artist type, and allows uh, services to plug into that and create a bespoke music experience for uh, their users, which evolves over time. Of course, this initiative has been touted in the press as a company's response to the growth uh, and, the, uh, and the success of the Econest in this space. So guys, let's take it from the top. First of all, uh, let's talk about the acquisition. Uh, do you think that you know the only reason why Sony sold is because it wanted to consolidate its bottom line, and you know Sony is not doing that great uh, this year, and so they wanted a, a quick sale to boost uh, to boost the the, the coffers, uh, so, so to speak, uh, at the end of the year? Or do you think there's another reason why Sony decided to get rid of the company? Martin, any any thoughts on that? I'm not sure whether Sony have, have got rid of the company. I think that that language is oh, possibly, yeah, sure. yeah, uh, yeah, possibly yeah. a little bit harsh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'd say yeah, that you know. Right. Grace Note and Sony have had a long relationship and you know they, they were bought for an extremely large amount of money, a yeah. hugely overvalued amount of money um, back when they were initially purchased, which was a while ago. And you know, I think Sony, they thought that they were going to be getting more out of this deal than they en- ended up getting. And I think that they couldn't really see themselves down the road doing anything with the data set that they built up um, by Grace Note. Now, one of the nice things that they did do is they kind of left Grace Note alone to do what they wanted to do and to work on the stuff that they wanted to work on, albeit with not a really, not a large team. Um, but, you know, they didn't really innovate very, very quickly. They've had the same product for a long time. Their early API was, you know, it was early. It wasn't necessarily great. It didn't match up. And it, it feels like, Quite often, um, Grace and I have, have kind of been playing catch up with other services, the Econess being one of them, um, and that they weren't necessarily getting used for anything other than Sony stuff. They obviously they did have a few deals that they got inked, but they were probably all brought in, you know, via Sony, and it didn't necessarily go as well as it was. I think at the end of the day, it was a difficult company for Sony to manage. You know, they're not a data company, and yeah. it's it's not the kind of thing that they necessarily needed to have in their portfolio. Now, Tribune are very much a data company and what they're providing uh, as services is essentially lacking in one thing and that's music data uh, yeah. and they needed a company to, to round that out I mean you know they provide you know data for listings for film stuff uh, basically they sell their content out to cable providers um, in the US um, 
And, you know, as we see now more music data information being stuck onto different bits of content, if you look at services like Shazam, and the way that they're popping up all over TV advertising and that kind of thing right now. Yeah. There is a lot more of that kind of second screen aspect uh, coming into cable TV that needs the backing of a service like this. Now, Grace Note Rhythm is kind of timely because you do need a deeper insight into the music and you know what's actually happening within music rather than just information about a piece of music. Yeah. Um, however, you know they must have been working on this for some time. But again, you know this is information that you can get out of the Echoness and have been able to get out of the Echoness for some time. Um, and in that sense, again, it feels like, you know, quite the catch up play. Um, yeah. however, you know, as an addition to Tribune's portfolio and as an addition to the data services that they can provide, I think it's a good acquisition. 170 million is not a bad deal. No. You know, sure it's 90 million less than what Sony paid for it, but I think it really, you know, it, it solidifies the value in music data services, you know, to a point where this is one of the first big acquisitions that we've seen, you know, of this nature of a company like this, yeah. um, you know, for that amount of money. And, you know, I think that, you know, as far as valuations go, you know, it feels like, you know, it's ju it's a just valuation. It's a right valuation. You know, it roughly works out at something in the region of like $1 per track that they know about. Yeah. I think they know about 180 million tracks, <laughs> uh, $170 million. So, you know, if, if you work on those numbers, then, you know, there's some pretty good valuations for other companies out there like this. I'm sure that, you know, over at the Econest, there is a pricked up, certainly those of, uh, their investors will have for real. Yeah, sure. And, and you're right to talk about, you know, the fact that the company actually held its value compared to others. For example, uh, you know, the, the last FM uh, changed hands uh, to CBS uh, at around the same time, uh, in 2007, I think, not in 2008. And, and that valuation has dropped considerably more than uh, Grace Notes. So, so definitely uh, something that, uh, that to keep in mind. Uh, and Ben, do you feel like uh, it, it it happens uh, more often for companies that are in, you know, in the space early that they can't quite manage to uh, adapt as quickly, or they end up playing catch up a little bit when it comes to implementing new new strategies, like for example, an API driven strategy in the case of GraceNote. Yeah, well, I guess you know the deal now kind of looks like it did kind of bar the ninety million hit work out quite nicely for everybody. Sony want to be more just a consumer company, as you said. They're not a data company, so it makes more sense for them to be where they are now. Yeah, and you know maybe that will allow them to do this API kind of stuff um, and similar things, rather than be sort of tied down to. Or well, Sony did leave them quite alone, but tied into sort of what Sony are doing, and now they can kind of go for the other clients. And data has just become so valuable that yeah. and data and music together, you know, it's it's going to make a lot of money somehow. You know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ma Martin, what, what do you think about pricing? You know, I, I think you, you were talking about the fact that, uh, you know, the Aconest has been offering a service like this for quite some time. Do you think price is, uh, pricing is going to play a big factor in uh, whether companies decide to go for one company or the other uh, when choosing what they, what they need to do? Yeah, it, it definitely, definitely uh, is a deciding factor. Um, and I think that, you know, it's sort of been a little bit easier um, in the past because there have been so few of these companies around but as more of them kind of enter into the space with larger you know more informative data sets you know at varying prices then you know it's it's going to be easier for companies to choose which one they go with you know because at the end of the day you know hopefully they should be doing their analysis uh, their algorithmic analysis of this stuff correctly uh, enough to you know have the same level of information that other companies would have so you can kind of play them off against each other if you'd need to um, as for how much they're going to charge for this, I don't know. That's the problem is that, is that most of the deals that are done for data like this are done on a case-by-case -case basis, yeah. depending on how many data points you need, what kind of you know depth of data set you need. You know, it, there is no sort of one set price, which makes it a little bit difficult um, to kind of to speculate uh, on you know what it might be. But sure. it, is worth, it is worth noting that you know, this isn't you know, a, a new thing for Grace Note from an API point of view. You know, they've, you know, been supporting events like Music Hack Day for a while and they've had their API out there, you know, for a while now. Um, not as long as the Echonest have, and they certainly haven't had that developer first focus yeah. that the Echonest have had, which has been so uh, successful for them because they've had the platform that allows people to demonstrate what can be done before companies then jump on board and say, actually, we would like to license some of your information. Grace Note have gone traditionally from the other way, and they focused more on the business, you know, more on the B2B yeah. uh, side of things, and then you know, also had an API that developers could play with. And I think what we're going to see is a little bit of a shift uh, there to uh, you know, a, B2, a, well, a B2D 
yeah. if we can call it that, uh, as well as the B2B, which, you know, obviously Tribune are going to be, you know, pushing that massively because it's a core part of, you know, what they've paid for is to, you know, hook this into the deals that they've got with the cable companies. But, yeah. you know, with, with Rhythm, they're really looking for people to build on top of it uh, and actually start building some things that are going to push both the innovation of what you can do with the Gracenet platform, but also push the innovation that, you know, Tribune as a whole can actually achieve yeah. with you know, the purchase of this platform. Sure. And, and a question for you both, but, uh, you know, uh, Ben first. I was wondering, you know, these companies are essentially relying on uh, a, a massive expansion of the need for uh, data uh, uh, around music and, and media in general. Um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of companies come into this space, especially when it comes to music discovery. But it's not clear yet as to uh, how many, if any, which of these companies are going to be able to stick around financially in terms of, you know, having a business model that's going to work and uh, and whether instead like there's going to be a lot of big players that these companies are going to sell data to uh, so ben do you feel like there's going to be a, the opportunity to have a more granular approach where there's going to be a number of companies that can survive in this ecosystem of music discovery and 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 you know internet radio or do you think that we're going to end up seeing some sort of uh, uh, you know aggregation of big players and uh, a few big players that purchase this kind of data from the likes of the aconest and grace note Sure. Yeah. Well, um, the big players who have the money to able to do it are obviously going to be able to survive a, a bit longer than someone who's just deciding to come new to it. Um, but the thing is, there's so much appetite for data in so many sectors, and there's so many companies just trying to get more of an insight to everything than everyone else, yeah. because the the data kind of already has value. Someone just needs to give it value. So. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely potential for a lot of companies in the space, but I, I think over time, big players are going to emerge in it. Yeah, sure. M Martin, what are your thoughts? Of course, you know, w we know we've been immersed in the startup world for such a long time. And, uh, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on the sustainability of services that are using these, uh, these, these data sets in the long term? And uh, is it going to come down to big players making the purchase? I, th I think there is a... I think there are different points in, in the life cycle for, for companies like this. Um, you know, either there's going to be one like, main company that becomes the de facto provider of, you know, music analysis data for, you know, for most of the people that want to use it. Um, and then they, you know, they just kind of cancel everybody else out because there isn't any business left there. I don't necessarily see that happening. What I do see is that the, the outsourcing of this to companies like this will probably change down the line as new companies get bigger. Yeah. You know, there is a reason why Spotify haven't done this themselves. It's because they wanted to concentrate on their core product. So they've outsourced it. Will they always outsource it? Maybe not. Will they, then, will they buy a company to actually do this stuff for them? Possibly. Will they build their own version? Maybe they already have. They've certainly got enough information, you know, that they could be doing it at this stage. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's probably too early to say. At the moment, there's definitely enough business going around for, for everybody Absolutely. to have, you know, to have a shot at it. I'd say that you know there are different aspects to that business, and you know, there is the streaming side of it, and then there's the other. And I think that Grace Note and Tribune are going to handle the other, whereas Econest is still going to handle the streaming side of things yeah. for now. But that may change. Yeah, sure. And talking about the difficulties in keeping companies uh, uh, operating, uh, the news came uh, towards the end of December that XFM has uh, decided to close its doors. Uh, that will happen on January the 15th. So if you've been away during the Christmas break and you uh, had an XFM account with lots of data on it, uh, there is actually the opportunity now to take that data out and import it into Tomahawk. So you, that's one of the things you can do with that data if you were on XFM. Uh, they said that essentially the cost of Processing millions of new songs every month while attempting to keep the data relevant and usable is monumental and the technical challenges are compounded by the litigious nature of the music industry, which means that every time we have a, any meaningful growth is coupled with immediate attention of the record labels in the form of takedowns and legal emails. So essentially the company had trouble on the technical front to keep up with the, the data and also on the legal front uh, whenever they had a spike in traffic then they had issues with the record labels. So uh, it's unfortunate, but you know I, I just wanted to point that out because uh, I, I just made the point on, on the potential sustainability of music discovery companies in, in, the, in the long term and and that's an example of a company that didn't quite manage to to uh, to make it work uh, uh, you know can you see a different uh, Ben can you can you see a different outcome for XFM uh, if the company had you know been alive and well today maybe operating uh, through Spotify or streaming music in a different way than they're doing right now you know do, do you think that 
the fact that it was a company that launched four years ago before streaming services got big kind of ended up dooming it in, in the way that it operated? Um, I don't know. Well, they kind of, the way they said that just the cost of it overwhelmed them, it just goes yeah. to show how difficult it is kind of for a company to try and stay small in music streaming. In a way, you have to get big. I mean, Spotify brought in something like three, 300 million in venture capital last year. They just need that money to keep going. Right. And even smaller companies, the legal costs are probably so huge, along with keeping up with all the technical stuff. But it's just so expensive. So for, you know, I can kind of see the ecosystem now. It seems like for a startup now to even come in would just be almost near impossible because of the amount of just raw capital you'd need at the start. Um, so, you know, they've been around for four years and they just didn't really get sort of big enough. You know, it wasn't widespread enough. You know, something like Spotify is a household name, but um, they just weren't big enough to keep going. And that was going to always happen, I guess, yeah. you know. Yeah, sure. Martin, do you, do you agree with that? It's just they didn't manage to scale fast enough or, or big enough to justify the business. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I actually met Dan Cantor from XFM uh, four years ago this month uh, at, uh, at the Medium Hack Day um, when he came out to do that. And that was just the time that they were starting to launch it. And it was a very different proposition to start with. Let's not forget that, you know, it, it started out more as a little kind of music discovery tool of an extension. Uh, if you will, uh, that then decided that it needed to become something bigger. And I think it was once they decided that, that, you know, they, they made the choice, right, to either stay as something that was useful for people or to kind of, you know, grow it out and become the bigger thing and actually try for a slice of that pie. And I think, you know, I definitely agree, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to do uh, a startup of this nature. You know, the music discovery space is pretty full and you really have to stand out or grow very, very quickly in order to, you know, get that piece of it and to retain your yep. piece of that particular pie. And I think that, you know, the processing side of things, I mean, you know, there, there are reasons for doing it, you know, I can understand that, you know, from a server processing point of view, yeah, very expensive. You can't get the money back through traditional advertising if you don't have the numbers. And I think at the end of the day, their, you know, their slice was a little bit too small to actually, you know, make up that money. So, yeah, it's, it's a shame, but... You know, I think we're going to see this happen to more than to just XFM. I think that, you know, it'll start to happen to more and more companies as people, you know, pick their, you know, streaming service and their music discovery, you know, home of choice and stick with it. Yeah. Um, you know, just because you can't have five of these things. There's no need to have five of these things, yeah. you know, and people will go with the one that works best for them at that particular point in time. So, you know, maybe XFM started out good for people, but then something else came along and something else came along and people yeah. would just flip between them. Exactly. Keep, keeping the retention is hard. Yeah, yeah no, it's, that's absolutely true. And, uh, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with companies that, for example, are relying on, on the, the APIs of the likes of Deezer and Spotify to be able to offer their service uh, uh, as to how they are going to monetize their, their own app or their own service uh, as, a, as a third party, essentially, that offers a way of curating music. And uh, moving on from Grace Note, uh, I, I want to talk about uh, the Rap Genius story. So in the couple, uh, couple of weeks uh, where DMT was off, uh, well, it wasn't off, but it wasn't uh, running the normal news show, uh, Rap Genius has taken a bit of a battering. At the end of December, it was uh, exposed in the implementation of a growth hack, which essentially consists in asking uh, bloggers to add a bunch of hyperlinks to specific Justin B. Uh, lyrics at the end of a post in exchange uh, that post would be tweeted by Rap Genius guaranteeing what they called uh, a massive growth and, and for the post to blow up essentially uh, so the hack was exposed by uh, hack, uh, by blogger John Marbach and soon after uh, as Google became aware that this was happening they actually decided to penal penalize uh, Rap Genius and uh, the company dropped from the top of uh, Google's uh, search rankings and lost uh, over 80% of its traffic in the process going from 800,000 daily uniques to uh, around 100,000. So a massive, massive uh, loss of traffic, which demonstrate how powerful Google is uh, for these companies. And uh, then uh, after 10 days uh, came Google's U-turn in the process and they reinstated uh, uh, Rap Genius's uh, uh, search rankings pretty much as they were before. Uh, so it seems like there's a bit of a truce here going on between Rap Genius and Google as Google realizes that fans want the Rap Genius content uh, as well. So um, what is happening here? Are we looking here at a problem that 
is just a rap geniuses problem or is this more of a google problem in the way that uh, the algorithm is set up and is uh, sort of hackable in this way uh, you know do you think that other companies that rely on these types of hacks are going to decrease that practice uh, and uh, is this going to have an impact essentially on on the industry as we see it and on the ly lyrics industry specifically but on the on the sort of uh, web search seo optimization world uh, uh, as a whole B ben what are your thoughts well, um, it's kind of interesting the way that it seemed like Google were taking it really seriously and a lot of people who were thinking of growth hacking were, hacking were maybe like, let's definitely not do that, look what happened to those guys. Right. But then at the same time, the fact it turned into a bit of a slap in the wrist means a lot of people are looking at it like, oh, it's because they've got someone like Andreessen behind them. And would maybe be, it, there'd be the thought that if you've got a big valley company behind you, you're fine, you can kind of do what you like and even Google can't do much more than just slide you down for a little while. Yeah. But at the same time as that, it is worth kind of noting that Rap Genius's product is just a heck of a lot better than other like music lyric sites. There's just so many very poor ones that people do want Rap Genius. Um, so I I think kind of it it is a problem that Google need to decide what they're going to do because um, you know a little slap in the wrist for a pretty big company. That could set people off doing it completely because it could ruin a smaller company. But um, ultimately, I, I think Google showed that um, uh, if you do have a big company behind you, a big investor behind you, you might be fine getting away with that kind of thing. Yeah. And also, uh, it, it almost feels like it's fine to do this as long as you don't get caught, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there were some people saying, why did Google not spot it earlier? There's a lot of people yeah. checking that no one's doing that. Were Google letting it slide the whole time because of the fact that it's a, slight, a better product? So, um, yeah, the fact that it was a journalist was it came, brought it up. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that was just from from an organic uh, email conversation that he exposed. It wasn't from a, from an actual analysis of the, of the data. So, uh, Martin, what are your th our thoughts on this? Do you think this is going to have a broader impact than just the, the one story? And does it put the pressure on Google? No, I don't think it's going to have that much impact at all. Really, I think that you know. It, Rap Genius even trying this in the first place is very in keeping with their overall attitude. Uh, the way that they operate generally is this is is in this kind of way. They, you know, they'd rather ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. And I kind of like the way that they they go down that route and the way that they they run the, they run the company is very much like, well, you know what? If we lose it all tomorrow, then fine. At least we had fun when we did it. You yeah. know, and Google's you know, Google's response was the equivalent of putting Rap Genius in the naughty corner. You know, it was. It's like, oh, you did a bad thing. You know, they needed to respond exactly the way that they've responded because, at the end of the day, you know, Rap Genius is a good product, and it makes their search results better. Which, at the end of the day, is Google's main product and the one that they make the majority of their money from. Yeah. This was really just the case of, you know, what you are going to be put in the naughty corner for a little bit. We'll show you just how much we can affect you if you do this. You know, and then you know they have to pop it back up. It was always going to go back up the rankings. Yeah. Um, you know, Google cannot do without having this there because at the end of the day, you know, people will go elsewhere because you know, apparently other search engines do exist, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, Rap Genius is still ranked relatively well in all of those. So you know, the 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 link juice is working well. Uh, yeah. Just everywhere else, just not in Google. And at the end of the day, they needed to keep it there. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I, the overall thing it was just kind of hilarious. I think I found yeah. it more amusing than uh, than anything else. It, you know, I'd actually, you know, if it wasn't for it being exposed by a journalist, you know, I just there's something about the whole story that makes me think that Rap Genius did it on purpose. Yeah. You know, I I, th I think that you know it's been great press for them, really. Uh, and, you know, Google were never really going to be like, oh, we can't have this out there. It's totally negative. Because at the end of the day, SEO hacking has been around like this for so much, so long. You yeah. Know, their algorithms can only improve and they do keep the majority of spammy stuff down. You know, this was just to try to keep, you know, everything up at the top. And, you know, I can imagine now that without the need for SEO hacking like this, there are exponentially more links inbound to rap genius than there were before <laughs> yeah. this so actually they probably helped themselves by doing it at the end of the day i think you know could they have set the whole thing up i think they could have yeah <laughs> 
and uh, uh, of course uh, this week it's uh, CES week in Las Vegas and it looks like uh, all guns are pointed at Sonos as both Pure and Samsung have released new hardware that competes directly with Sonos's product line. So Pure has also announced a partnership with SiriusXM in the US that will allow users, uh, premium users of the service to stream SiriusXM stations via Pure hardware and it also opened up its platform to third-party developers to allow the use of the speakers from pretty much any digital music service out there. And so our CES uh, wireless and Bluetooth speakers are really all the rage although the one thing that I haven't seen is uh, uh, many or any announcements around the Spotify Connect platform which I was excited about when it was announced but I haven't I was like, waiting for speakers to come out in the sort of consumer range like sort of around 100 to 100 dollars uh, range but it looks like it's still pretty much limited to really high-end uh, systems or very specific systems so uh, I wonder why that uh, I wonder why that is uh, I wonder if there's any snacks in the in the in the uh, production of, the, of these speakers or in impl implementation from the hardware manufacturers uh, and so uh, you know I wanted to ask you guys about that and also whether you've seen anything else from uh, CES uh, on the music front or the music uh, potential front that uh, gets you excited for example uh, the Pebble has launched an app store which is going to have uh, probably a lot of different ways of controlling music from from your watch uh, there's a bunch of other uh, you know ways of interacting with your home which may influence the way music is, is consumed as well uh, Martin what are your thought, uh, thoughts on that either the speaker side or or anything else from ces that you thought was interesting this week uh i mean the the app store for pebble is definitely something that, that caught my attention because you know any opportunity to provide a new distribution channel for for you know for music or otherwise is going to be you know something that people are going to look at very seriously and you know the pebbles actually end up doing far better than i thought it was going to as well um, yeah. i see a lot more positive stuff about the pebble than i think initially uh was first reported which you know it's a great sign i think that you know the, the wearable technology has definitely been the big thing for ces this year yeah. you know it's you know everything that you can possibly strap onto your body that can some way control something or record something for you is you know is where we're all going you know at the end of the day back to the future was kind of right um but still no hoverboards <laughs> at ces which is a tremendous <laughs> disappointment um, you know and i think you know from the music industry point of view and certainly from the uh you know manufacturers point of view having an app store uh, on pebble is going to be a big deal i think that you know, we'll see some stuff popping up here that, you know, is a lot to do with, you know, the headphone side of things, you know, obviously, you know, the connected headphones thing has started to pop up already. Yeah. I've seen presentations recently from a few companies that are just, you know, looking for investment to get their products up to scratch. You know, it, I wouldn't put it past companies like Beats and also Urban Ears to, to get something out there, you know, very, very quickly, because from what I've read, the... Uh, you know, building stuff for Pebble is actually very, very easy and yep. therefore it could be very quick and hopefully they've got, you know, a decent enough uh, acceptance process there to actually make this stuff, you know, rapidly proto prototypable, yes. if that's a real word, um, rapidly prototypable and then, uh, you know, easily releasable so that, you know, we can see this happening uh, faster than yep. it would do with, you know, other manufacturers that are named after fruit. Yeah, <laughs> and I've got a Pebble right here, and I'm, I'm quite excited about the App Store as well because uh, I haven't. I, I love it because of the notification side of things and the text messages and the emails. When I do need like to get that urgent email, I can just set it to receive specific emails, and and that's great. But on the app side, I haven't actually used it. Uh, over the past few months because it's just too much of a hassle to go and find the app that you need from the different sites that have apps for the Pebble on. Download it, make sure, you know, it, you know you have, you delete the apps that you you can only have 10 at the moment on, on, on the watch. And, and so it's a bit of a hassle. So I haven't really used the app side of things uh, uh, very much uh, and I look forward to seeing whether I'm going to be using it more with the, with the store in place. Uh, ben, on your side, uh, you've you've been doing some, uh, some coverage of CES as well, like uh, looking at what's happening over there too. Uh, you were talking about TVs actually earlier when we were doing the prep and uh, uh, you know what are your thoughts on connected TVs uh, I'm hearing more and more people talking about how surprisingly they are finding themselves using TVs more and more to access music services like Spotify they didn't think they would but they, when they, once they actually get the app on the TV they actually end up listening to music by their television uh, what are your thoughts on, the, uh, on that well yeah uh, alongside TVs connected things in general toothbrushes doorbells big part of CES this year and so just controlling your music on your TV with your phone Seems like not that weird a thing to happen, really. And right. if the TV has good speakers, you know, you'll just use that instead of going out and buying some incredibly expensive set of speakers, really. Um, but also at CES, I think this wearable stuff, um, at the moment, 
a lot of what's coming out for it at the moment is um, the fitness tracker bands and stuff like that. And when you look at stuff like the recommended playlists and stuff that people like Spotify will create, a lot of them are very heavily tied to fitness. So I think as the wearable app ecosystem develops, which hopefully Pebble and the sort of unnamed fruit company will also kind of accelerate, then we're going to see a lot more of the kind of the streaming services getting involved in wearable in a much bigger way, I think. And there's definitely room for these fitness trackers to start including some more ingrained kind of music ideas with them. You know? Yeah. And I, I don't know if it came out of CES, but I, I, I need to, to uh, put this in the show notes. Uh, it's something called the iRing, and it's a motion, con motion controller for your music apps, which is a ring. So that's amazing. And I'm going to yeah. put the link in the show notes. It was posted yeah. by, by the guys at Palm Sounds, uh, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, so yeah, uh, rings as well, not, not just uh, uh, watches and glasses this year. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Um, <laughs> earrings maybe one day who knows uh, and uh, so we can't really go through a show in January without talking about Beats because everybody's waiting for Beats to launch their new service uh, this month and uh, and so uh, we got some more rumors uh, uh, today coming from the New York Post uh, and uh, they report that Beats is planning a very big marketing push uh, at the launch uh, towards the end of this month that could include a Super Bowl advert so that's a big investment because you know Super Bowl advert can cost anywhere between three and five million dollars for 30 seconds so it's not a small change and i think it's uh, probably around about half uh of the biggest marketing campaign any streaming music service has uh, has, has done so far. Uh, so uh, that's an interesting news, and it, it's also interesting to see that they're going to do a big push at first release, because of course this is a product that hasn't really been released in beta, so it's a product that's coming out to a mass market and has to work right from the get-go. It can't really have any issues from the start, or it can't really have much of a, uh, you know, uh, working prototype it just needs to work when it comes out uh, the other rumor that came out from the new york post article is that beats audio has actually beats music has actually managed to do a deal with the at and uh, the u.s carrier the largest u.s carrier in order to, uh, that that would actually incorporate beats music uh, uh, into its plans and and uh, would offer that to its subscribers so that's a very big move uh, and it comes in spite of the fact that at and actually uh, acquired uh, uh, move music uh, which is another music subscription service uh, by proxy uh, with its acquisition of Lee wireless uh, a few months back and so you know first of all let's talk about the marketing side of things do you think it makes sense for beats music to spend a lot of money on marketing and do you think in that sense it may be offset by beats audio because i would imagine that any advert with beats music in will actually also feature beats audio headphones so that advertising might be in a way subsidized by the bigger company right uh, martin what were your thoughts on that Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly going to be uh, subsidized by the bigger company. You know, at the end of the day, people seem surprised that Beats have got money. It's like, <laughs> like, of course they do. It's the, it's the, the biggest selling headphone in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, there's an enormous amount of cash behind this. They've taken on a huge amount of investment. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, they, they bought Mog, so the backbone of the streaming music service is already there. You know, from, from an operating cost point of view, I imagine that it would be in the low millions uh, you know, from that sense. So actually, a lot of the investment is really for growth And marketing, yeah. So to drop four million, you know, on a Super Bowl ad for you know, and you have as many eyes on as you do, you know, sure, fine. If they want to do that, they can go ahead and do it. Will it have the impact? I think that they're hoping they're going to get. I don't think so. Yeah. You know, I think that you know the way that they're doing it. Look, reading the article, it was like, okay, so you know what, Beats Music have got the how to build a streaming music service playbook, and they are opening it at page one. And doing all the things that every other company has done in the past that have been successful, which is no bad way of approaching running a business. Of course yeah. it isn't. You know, take the ideas that work from other people, copy it, plug it in, change a few things, see what happens. Yeah. Now, they're taking the, the AT&T partnership directly from what happened with Deezer. Deezer's huge growth in France initially came from their partnership with Orange. And it was a fantastic deal, worked brilliantly, and offering out to a, a, you know, a subscriber base for free as part of that package is not only a, a great way of signing an initial deal that solidifies a huge amount of subscribers that will probably remain loyal um, throughout the, their time because they're not parting with any cash, or at least they right. don't think they are. Uh, and you know, I see that working well for them. I don't see them blowing anyone out of the water, though. Um, You know, at the end of the day, you know, these things take time and they are significantly behind everybody else in yeah. this space. Um, 
raises the question of do we need another streaming music service yeah. uh, but you know that is a very different conversation that of we course. won't have now what I would say is that if they have somehow managed to implant into every Beats headphone ever sold a tracking device which means that they can actually <laughs> then locate every person that owns a pair of Beats headphones and give them a free subscription then they will blow Spotify out of the water but <laughs> unless they can do that I don't see it happening yeah. Ben, do you think there is a chance that they're going to include a free month or a free couple of months subscription with every Beats uh, audio headphone purchase from now on? And will that change things for, for Beats Music? Well, yeah, I think that would be a good move because like, we're spending so much on marketing. They have to just go at it as hard as they can and get as big as possible, as fast as possible. Um, you know, they're saying they're going to like blow Spotify away and stuff. That's, you know, really not going to happen unless they've got, they've got the brand name and that's good to just sort of push that out there and stuff but the problem is just getting people actually using it is again if they could track down everyone with the headphones give them something or get a free subscription when you buy headphones that kind of thing would work but the thing i've noticed about even that and the at&t partnership is it's they're just looking at america right now and while spotify is looking to grow there spotify is also big in europe and getting bigger elsewhere yeah. so even if they completely dominate the US market they can still lag behind someone else I mean yeah, they're but they do have to just go for it really and yeah. just give get as many people on the system as possible really and then hope it's a better one but at the moment you know it I, you know I couldn't see myself using it I, but then what do we need another streaming service is a different question yeah. exactly I mean I, I, I mean the only thing I can see from them is the fact that they are acknowledging the fact that uh, streaming hasn't quite yet gone mainstream and so they're probably trying to target everybody that hasn't got a Spotify subscription already because I just can't imagine what kind of differenti differentiating factor they can offer to subscribers of Spotify that would induce them to migrate their account to Beats which would be a pretty painful thing to do if you've been with Spotify for a while. Uh, so yeah that's going to be interesting to see whether they're just aiming at streaming na uh, streaming virgins or people that haven't actually put down any money yet for streaming or whether they're actually going to try and steal some customers away from some of the other streaming companies. But, sorry, um, uh, in a way they've already got a, a kind of a bigger brand name than Spotify. So, you know, I'd, I'd put them in a better position than a ridiculously well-funded startup to, to have a go at knocking some of the big guys out. But um, the brand name alone is going to have to do a lot of work, you know. Yeah. I think it could be possible down the line that Beats roll out a pair of headphones that you know need to be controlled via an app, and that is a direct connection, you know, between their so you know because the thing is people really like Beats headphones and they're very loyal to the brand, um, you know, and you can see that through the artist partnerships and stuff as well. They definitely have all the right ingredients in place to actually be able to do this and take a big chunk of the market. I, I just don't see this current offering being as big as they expect it to be. Yeah, sure. And and as I said, the iteration is going to be really interesting just to see if there's going to be some sort of a Twitter music effect because if they hype the service so much now, if they come out to the service that is not absolutely amazing, it's going to generate some sort of backlash, I think, in the press. And so that's going to be interesting to see how they present it, how it is and how good it is. And, and that's really going to make or break it, uh, I think, at, at least in, in the initial perceptions of it in, within the first few weeks of launching. Um, I, I think it'll be a decent enough first few weeks. You know, MySpace pumped a heck of a lot of money into their recent yeah. relaunch, and the initial users made it look pretty impressive. But you can't yeah. live spending four million dollars every TV ad or something, you know. So um, sticking around will be their real job. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, sticking with the streaming um, uh, and sort of uh, veering off a little bit, uh, uh, as well as talking about Beats Music, which we have to do because it's January and they're going to launch and oh. everybody's excited about it. The other thing that always happens every January is that we start getting the figures from the BPI and Nielsen SoundScan on sales. And so what happened in 2013? So uh, the IFBI, of course, uh, takes a little bit longer to do the worldwide tally. So we're going to have to wait uh, a few months for that. Uh, but the BPI reports that the uh, value of albums, singles and audio streams 
claims in the UK was down 0.5% uh, with a loss of around £5 million in 2012. So within that number, the big story is a continued decline of album sales, a minus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, album revenues, not album sales, uh, minus 3.6%, whilst the streaming market saw a 33.7% increase, uh, generating over £100 million pounds in revenues. Uh, the other factor that declined is the digital singles. They declined by 4.2% in sales, uh, which is something that, uh, you know, is... is uh, uh, is in common with what's being reported by Nielsen SoundScan in the US, where the decline was 5.7%, uh, the decline of digital track sales uh, over 2012 figures. So uh, both countries, we're seeing digital track sales declining. That's interesting. And in the US, it's the first time they declined since the launch of the iTunes stores, uh, store in 2001. So are we finally to the point where we can say that there is some effect of uh, uh, music streaming services into the sales that are starting to eat a little bit into the sales of digital tracks? You know, everybody was very cautious, uh, myself included, last year about talking about can cannibalization or people moving on from one format to the other. You know, we are all very aware that people are still doing both, even if they use Spotify, they still buy tracks. But this decline is kind of seems to signal that there is a little bit of a shift going on here and that people are using streaming services to uh, to uh, listen to single tracks and not buy them quite as much. Uh, a band, would you agree with that with that conclusion or is it still too early, to, uh, still too close to call, too, too early to, to tell? No, I think we can. This is only going to increase um, if you're using if you're listening to music on a computer, you know, it's going to become increasingly likely that you're not bothering to download the tracks. You know, if you can, the average music span for um, someone a month now is something like, uh, something like $10. Right. That's about one Spotify, that's your one month Spotify subscription. I think people are just going to be swapping those services for better value for money. And if people know where they can get for free on YouTube, I just think digital like track sales are only going to keep going down, you know, to the extent where we might even... I don't know, not five years' time, be sending vinyls over or something, because it's just <laughs> streaming's gonna, I think streaming's gonna, gonna take down digital downloading eventually. You know? Yeah. Martin, do, do, do you think, you know, uh, along the same lines? Yeah. I, I mean, all I've seen really over the last year is, is more and more people that I know moving into just pure streaming services and not really buying anything anymore. The, you know, one of the common reasons is that, you know, if you want, to buy stuff, you have to have it yeah. on all your devices. And it's just the time is just not something that people want to have to manage. You know, people are now at a point where they've chosen the streaming service that they want to use. And, you know, they've got their playlist set up and they're ready with their accounts. And they, you know, they know that that's the one they're going to use. They have all the apps and all the services. It's just simple. Yeah. And as Ben says, you know, for $10 a month, it's a fantastic value compared to actually going and buying stuff. You know, I haven't bought any tracks for probably at least five months now Definitely. and that's only really because you know the type of music i like is not necessarily you know on the whole reflected on the music streaming services but that is going to change and as things progress you know throughout 2014 you know we'll do this again in january 2015 and it'll be the same story in the same article just with bigger numbers yeah and i must admit like last month when the beyonce album came out and we were talking about it on the show extensively on that on that episode i was kind of thinking should i just buy it so that i can watch it all and listen to it all i just couldn't bring myself to do it because it's I, I, i'm just not gonna listen to it in that format uh, because you know, I listen to all my stuff on Spotify. I'm sure if people have audio or, or Deezer, they do the same. And it's just a bit of a hassle to try and transfer stuff over and then make sure that you have it. And and I I, I don't know. I just couldn't bring myself to do it, uh, which is a, a kind of a horrible admission to yeah. <laughs> to make. But uh, that's yeah. It's just a, yeah. But you know what? That actually that that approach does have an impact on an album like that because you know that that Beyonce record is an 18 track album that is really meant to be listened to in one big chunk. Yeah, uh, because it doesn't really make sense otherwise. You know, it's you know, it's a musical journey and whatnot, and, and you know, to listen to it in a more à la carte basis or you know, ad hoc basis, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense to way the record was actually intended. Yeah, and I think that you know what they did with that record was a great thing. You actually know, just chucking it out there with no promotion and saying, right, you know, here it is. The one thing they didn't think about is actually that no one's going to listen to it in the right order, and no one's probably well. Very few people are really going to listen to it from start to finish. So actually, you know, any of the sort of, you know, big creativity decisions, you know, behind, you know, why it was actually ordered that way and why that kind of stuff was done have sort of negated by the fact that, you know, we're in a streaming world and, you know, people aren't going to attack the album in the same way that you would expect them to. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure, absolutely. And uh, uh, talking about uh, big album launches like Beyonce's, uh, uh, Gaga uh, was sort of seen as a, a, a big disappointment for 2013 for the recorded music industry, even though you know the album still sold over half a million copies in the US. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, finally, Lady Gaga sort of broke her silence uh, around the release, and she actually posted on the Little Monsters Network a few of her, of her thoughts uh, around uh, what happened on, on, the, uh, on the album release and, and why it kind of ended up going the way it did. Uh, you know, the, the comments started... A, a, around uh, uh, the reason why the video for Do What You Want ended up being delayed and then ended up straying into comments around art pop in general. So she said, uh, it is um, about the video uh, initially. It is late because just like with the applause video, unfortunately, I was given a week to plan and execute it. And then she also wrote, those who have betrayed me gravely, mismanaged my time and health and left me on my own to damage control and any problems that ensued as a result. Uh, millions of dollars are not enough for some people. They want billions, they want trillions. Uh, I was not enough for some people. They wanted more. Interestingly, though, she doesn't place any blame on the record label. She actually says that the record label backed her all the way and that uh, they're still working with her and she's really excited to finally get the project going the way that she wanted it to go after the people that weren't really supporting her left. So the comments uh, of the star come as she parted with, with, her, with her longtime manager Troy Carter. So one can't help but thinking that some of these comments are directed at him or, or, or the team that she was working with uh, on the release. And it, but I think it's going to be a real up, uphill climb to, for her to actually relaunch the album in the way that she's hoping to or keep working the album in that way because I haven't really seen any slow burner pop albums uh, oh, you know it, it's not really a thing that makes sense in 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 in, in the pop world uh, i don't know martin do, do you think that this is possible do you think that she can turn things around a little bit for art pop or should she just move on to the next record i mean it sounds like there, there were a lot of problems around the release and she had back surgery and all sorts of things but uh, you know is this just a doomed album for now Oh, uh, maybe. But not doomed, I mean, not doomed it, like in the sense that, that it's, it's still sold quite a lot, but in terms of like the next six months or so, can it, can it pick up uh, pace again? No, the time for that has passed. You know, if, if, she, if she wants to come out with something new, then, you know, go ahead, absolutely do it and, you know, feel free to do it the way that she thinks it should be done. Um, you know, I, I can't help but think that these are kind of a little bit the rantings of someone who wants to be an artist rather than a musician, you know. Uh, her fans are, you know, they're, they're quite vocal about the fact that, you know, she's changed quite a lot in the last, you know, few years. You know, she's really not releasing, you know, what she was known for, which is like really solid pop bangers. You know, there just aren't really that many on art pop. It's just not a very good album. Yeah, you know, in my opinion, you know, like compared to you know previous albums, this one's just not as good, and you know albums that just aren't as good or don't meet the expectations of you know what i think people wanted from her you know it's just not going to sell as well and yeah. you know I, I think that her you know she, she she annoys me with her conceptual artist kind of uh, <laughs> you know approach to things and you know what well, yeah. you know what sometimes you are only given a week to do a music video no one else in the industry complains about that but you're going to okay yeah. Yeah, and it's awesome. you know i I think at the end of the day, you know, it, it's it's not gone well. You know, she feels annoyed by that. She's going to have to have a rant on it somewhere because, you know, that is her want. There's there's no way to kind of bring it back. I think resurrecting an album is a stupid idea. Just carry on. Go back into it. You know, if you want to do things yourself, then go ahead and do so. Record some better tunes, put them out, and you'll see people buying them. Yeah. You know, or streaming <laughs> them more in this case. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, ben, uh, you know, what are your th uh, thoughts on this? Do you, do you th yeah, well, I don't think you, you can't resurrect an album after six months. The best option would be come out with a new single, tag that on as a bonus track and then relaunch it. And some people might buy it and everyone would hate you for it. But um, I, I think, the, yeah, I think just leave it, move on and then look back and that can be the hilarious blip in your repertoire that in 10 years might be yeah. definitive or something you know but um <laughs> you're not gonna it would take something pretty spectacular to get anyone really listen to it yeah you know? it would take like a, an insanely good remix by somebody <laughs> i guess that's actually, the only that's thing that's true could... actually a good remix <laughs> could change everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> at least from a singles perspective anyway yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's it's interesting i mean for me the things that surprised me was the fact that she didn't lay into the label at all and she actually said that the label supported her all the way and given all the rumors that flew around about how much they spent and whether they would have to do layoffs uh, on the, the back of how much they spent and everything else you would have thought there would have been some issue with the label but apparently that's not the case so at least it's a 
it's a good thing to hear that that, that relationship is still intact and, and still solid. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I think at this point we can sort of start wrapping up. Uh, I wanted to finish off with some of the headlines that we didn't get a chance to speak about today. Uh, so first of all, Leo, Leo Coin is going to present the plans for the, his secretive project 300 at Medem in February. Uh, Ministry of Sound is safe as the club reached an agreement with the property developer that was threatening to close it down uh, due to noise uh, concerns. And finally, uh, Bill Word, I think I hope that's the right pronunciation, is stepping down as editor of Billboard as uh, uh, the Prometheus Guggenheim Media Group has named Janice Min, editor of The Hollywood Reported, as the new editor of Billboard. So uh, a bit of change over there. And uh, he uh, actually Word had a, a great letter that he published last week on Billboard and in hindsight it could be seen as a farewell to the publication it's called uh, a call uh, to focus on music for music's sake and it's definitely worth a read you can find the link in the show notes it's a very good uh, letter that he wrote and uh, a lot of things uh, a lot of the things that he, that he talked about he talks about are actually uh, pretty true uh, guys uh, a plug from uh, your end so first of all uh, Ben uh, what do you guys do a strategy uh, I and uh, what's going on around there how can people uh, uh, you know, keep yeah. updated and stay in touch. Uh, well, we're an executive intelligence service. Um, you can find us online, digitalmedia.strategyi.com, or follow us on Twitter at strategyi, and you'll be seeing us pushing out all our predictions for 2014. Great. And so, uh, you operate as a as a service or as a subscription service? How, how does it work? Uh, we're yeah, we're a subscription service on a B two B basis. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Martin, in your end, uh, anything uh, going on at uh, SandGrid or on the Hack Days front uh, that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, from a SandGrid point of view, still pleased and proud to be the email deliverability service of choice for all your streaming music services, uh, currently powering uh, the emails that you're getting from uh, Spotify, from Pandora, from Audio, from Deezer. Um, I believe uh, Mog as well, so that could, right. could that well end up uh, being you know Beats as well, but I won't speculate on that. Um, so you know, shifting uh, shifting mail for the streaming music services since two thousand and nine, and pleased to be doing so. Uh, from a music actor point of view, uh, we're going to be out at Medem uh, mm. on the first of February through to the third of February for the fourth uh, Medem Hack Day, uh, where we're taking thirty developers uh, over to Can to spend uh, two days building. Uh, new and innovative applications uh, with music and technology to present to the media audience at 11 a.m. on Monday the 4th of February at Media itself. That is awesome, and I will be there. So uh, definitely uh, for all the listeners, look look forward to uh, at least a catch-up chat with Martin about what's been happening over there and maybe with uh, one or two developers or one or two of the people that are taking part in the Hack Day over at Medem. And uh, thanks so much. Uh, this is the weekly show or what we talk about the latest news in the digital music industry. So if you've listened uh, thus far, you probably know that by now. And uh, you can find the website on digitalmusictrends.com. The Twitter handle is at digimusictrends. And uh, there's also a one-to-one -one show where I interview... Uh, interesting uh, music startups and uh, uh, talk about interesting uh, digital uh, music marketing projects uh, you can find that on the site as well and that comes out every week too uh, thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and until next time and that's all for this week i really hope you enjoyed the show check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter